Hello, welcome to this video. And this video is going to be a very contentious video. I'm going back to that again. And I know some people in the comments are gonna go, oh no, Andy's gone back to that again. Why has he gone back to it? Well, if you're watching it, why are you watching it, right? It's something that comes back. And the reason is, is because I do get so much pushback for saying this. And then I think, am I wrong? And then I think about it and I think I'm not wrong. And this troubles me greatly, right? But I don't think that jazz is black music, right? And I've got a million reasons for thinking that. And I can't seem to find how much, however much I argue with myself, I can't seem to agree that a good way forward is to call jazz black music. So this video is going to be called Why I Believe That Jazz Is Not Black Music. Now we live in a society at the moment that as soon as I say that, there is assumption made of why I'm saying that. And that I am trying to take away the credit of geniuses like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, um, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, Albert Eiler, Archie Shepp, Herbie Hancock, um, you know, <laughs> Oscar Peterson, Wes Montgomery. I think I. I grew up loving these musicians. I grew up with a dad who loved jazz that would pull out Oscar Peterson albums and say, this is the best pianist that has ever lived, right? So these are all black musicians. Yes, they are. They're all geniuses. Yes, they are. Um, I am not a genius like Oscar Peterson, right? And it's got nothing to do with the color of my skin. His genius has got nothing to do with the color of his skin. Right, his genius, his, his genius, right? There's a reason why black musicians at the turn of the 20th century um, felt that they could um, express themselves through uh, jazz, a form that they had played a huge part in creating, without a doubt, a huge part, right? But because they played a huge part in creating it does not make me feel justified in saying, well, because they played a huge part, how many times have I got to say this, that um, this is black music, because I don't, think it's, um, I don't think it's ethically right to call it black music, right? Now, there's some people out there, they go, this is a, a white British person trying to take jazz away, like they always have. I mean, White people came up with the name jazz, didn't they? They they named it. They named it so they could, you know, take it and commercially affy it and, and make money out of it and appropriate it. You know, and the biggest people to make, you know, money out of jazz are the Benny Goodmans and the Kenny G's. And they've just appropriated this black art form. That is what people are going to think. Now, um, I am going to try and counter that, but it's going to take me a while to counter that on this video. So, we all love a list. I have come up with 10 reasons why I don't believe we should call jazz black music. Now, before we go on to that, there's a guy called Nicholas Payton out in New Orleans, and he doesn't like the word jazz. Miles Davis didn't like the word jazz. They, you know, there's, there's certain people, black people, who believe that, 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 as I just said, that was a, a way to categorize jazz, you know, to pull out the power, to take it over, to control it. That could well be the case. I'm not really discussing that there. Nicholas Payton has decided that it would be good to call it black American music. Now, there's a pushback against that uh, by musicians like Winter Marsalis and Branford Marsalis. Winter Marsalis and Branford Marsalis and a whole host of other musicians have said, no, this is simply American music. All right. So... Um, this isn't just simply an identity politics thing that, you know, I'm using the word black and I'm white and I shouldn't be allowed to talk about this. There is a thing in jazz that I've just sort of highlighted that there is there are people out there that believe in that idea. Now, I think that has come out of the funding structure that exists within jazz at the moment. This idea that emerged in the 1980s of a black classical um, music form created by black people in America that needs to be, you know, um, treasured and that um, America needs to um, 
pour money into the funding of jazz because in the past it was um, prejudiced against what black people did. So it's a sort of um, let's fight fire with fire type of approach. So that's the backdrop. So why is it, Andy? Am I some sort of right-wing racist? Why do I want to sit here and die on this hill of um, saying that jazz is not black music? Well, I've got 10 reasons. I'm going to start with the first one. Number one, right? I feel that categorising art by race is wrong. I think it's racist. I have no problem with Indian music from India being called Indian music. I have no problem with African music being called African music. I have no problem with Spanish music being called Spanish music, of, of, of um, music from Egypt called being called Egyptian music. I've got no problem with that. But you cannot call jazz African music because it's not African music, right? Um, there is an influence of Africa in jazz, but it's much less than the powers that be and the dogma and ideology around this would have us think. And I will try and explain that on this video as well as we go through. Um, but also, I feel it's racist. Um, I don't want to be characterised as a white musician. I would not want to be the greatest white musician in history. I want to be the greatest musician. And I love these musicians so much that I want Charlie Parker and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington to be seen as the great musicians that they are. I don't want Duke Ellington to be seen as a black composer. He's the greatest composer of the 20th century. As soon as we say he's a black composer making black music, right, um, then it's straight away that gets demoted and boxed off, right? Like saying Stravinsky was, was the greatest Russian composer. Or worse, Stravinsky was the greatest white composer. Can you see how awful that is? As soon as we mention this, and this is the idea of counting racism through colour blindness. And believe me, I have studied intersectionality and critical race th theory deeply. And I understand that there's a counter argument of that. That, that um, to fight fire, you have to fight it with fire. People like Imbra X. Kendi have said, if you want to um, counter racism, you have to counter it with more racism. Of course, he, he has been sort of, um, what's the word? His, his true colours have, have been shown and his character is now defamed. Should we get really listen to a guy like that? Okay? Um, I just think... From a Kantian point of view, if racism is wrong, racism is wrong. And um, it doesn't matter who does it and who does it to what. Now, the critical race theory lot believe that only white people can be racist. They believe in a white supremacy. I believe the idea of a white supremacy is wrong. I'm sorry. I think if you're going to talk about a white supremacy, then a lot of those white people are Jewish, aren't they? And we have the idea of a Jewish supremacy. It's exactly the same thing. And that's on the left why we see so much pushback against Israel, which are doing awful things to the Palestinians at the moment. But there is anti-Semitism there and the white supremacy idea. As soon as we start boxing people into boxes, that's racist. We have to watch how we do it. OK, um, so fundamentally, I start from not believing it's right to call any music black music. All right. I would feel uncomfortable, you know, that the music that comes from Senegal, right? I would rather call that Senegalese music because I'm sure people that are, are black who have got nothing to do with Senegal go, well, what's that got to do with me? You know, because in the end, black people are all different. They have all different beliefs. They come from different places. They have different cultures, just like white people, right? That's what they are. I don't think it's right. And I think the, the argument, yeah, but it, what it does is it, it, it sort of rebalances a racism that, that went before, you know, by drawing attention to the fact that black musicians are capable of doing something great. So that's very important. It, that's wrong. And the idea that um, there's an ownership there of the music, that I haven't got a right to really talk about it because I'm white. All right? That's just wrong. And, I, and, and it's like, um, can you imagine being a... a, a being interested in European classical music and you're black and you're up against that world which is white which is racist and you're trying to get an ask, ask you know entrance into it right and then someone's determined to say yeah well classical music's white music right I've spent 10 minutes on this first one right 
Number two, jazz is not African music. Okay, the slaves that came over to um, America, and this is very important in the history of jazz, culturally that was taken away from them. The, right, the, the slaves that were taken to South America were allowed to carry on their musical cultures and their traditions. And so last American music can be seen as a direct fusion between um, uh, Spanish music and African music. That's what it is, okay? There's a huge amount of African music in Latin American music. And when you hear all those drums and cross rhythms and claves, you can hear it told. That's not in jazz. The rhythms of jazz are much more like marching music, right? They come from um, Sousa marches and they come from the church. That is the, that is the rhythm. Right, the idea there's this polyrhythmical thing that's come through Congo Square. Congo Square was where, because, because New Orleans was relaxed, more integration goes on. And this is the point. Jazz is the product of integration, not the product of black people affirming their creative vision. It's about integration. And the reason why black people are so important is because if you're existing in a world of racism, of slavery, and then in 1865 you are given your freedom, you want access to the country that you now live in. You want access to that. You want to be a part of it. You want to grab it and have some of it yourself, right? But because of Jim Crow, black people in America couldn't. So they had to find a way of getting through it. And they were geniuses in taking this form, the folk forms that are around, and coalescing them with other people, opening them themselves up to influences. So, I was watching an interview, we went to Massage the other day, and he said a mind-blowing thing. The, the plantations in America were originally for um, white British um, penal subjects, the same as the way we sent people to Australia, mainly the Irish. We sent the Irish to work over in plantations, and that became the model that then the African slaves were put into. And so those plantations came up with a culture of um, Irish Celtic music. And um, the, the slavery part of um, jazz, Winter Masalis has said, you could see as being Afro-Celt, Afro-Celtic music. How insane is that? And this is why Louis Armstrong gets up and sings St. James Infirmary, right? Because that's the influence. It's not straight down the line. Right, the influence from slavery is not straight down the line. Um, let's move on, because I'm going to touch on all these things, but that jazz is not African music. It's got too much stuff in it. It's got European harmony, European arrangement, European instrumentation. The rhythms come from, um, like I said, the church, and they come from uh, marching music. Um, the techniques use a European classical music. The song structures of folk music, a lot of them come from um, Scottish folk songs, Irish folk songs. In there, we've got, um, uh, what else? We've got, what else would you have in jazz? The instrumentation, uh, the technique, the... Um, Technique, if you look at someone like Cindy Bechet, Cindy Bechet is the first great soloist in jazz before Louis Armstrong that we know of. He was a Creole, right? He saw himself as white. This is a whole history we've got to go into. This is another reason why I think it's wrong to call it black music because it denies what actually was the perception. If you believe in, in, in your truth, as most identitarians do, then you have to accept their truth. Sidney Bechet believed he was white. Jelly Roll Morton believed he was white, right? But anyway, uh, Sidney Bechet was taught by uh, Lorenzo Tio and the Tio family. It was a certain European classical technique that he was able to put onto the clarinet and then eventually the soprano saxophone, which enabled him to improvise in a certain way, in a virtuoso way. Those are the mechanisms. Sidney Bechet went to his grave saying that jazz was French, all right? Um, so, African music, it's in there. What, what comes directly from Africa? I, I would say, through the work song, it would be um, call and response, and I would call, and also vocalisation. Vocalisation is bending the nose. Well, I'm a man. You know, that, that type of thing, which then finds its way into the blues. But don't think the blues is African music. It emerged at the same time as jazz, and it's, it's like, again... European folk songs shot through with vocalisation work songs. 
I would argue that the blues is a lot closer to being arguably a black music form than jazz is, if we took just take the historical perspective. But but from my sort of moral point of view, and we can discuss this, I don't think it's right to call me anything um, to name a music by its race. So I've got through two of these categories. Number three, um, black people know any other race single-handedly created jazz, right? Black musicians played a huge part part in the creation of jazz. But let's just have a look at this and why I don't think this is right. Um, after 1865, um, the slaves were freed. There was a moment before the Jim Crow laws came in and that segregation started to kick in where um, black musicians and especially Creole musicians, as we said, were getting classical training. Um, a lot of slaves were sort of thrown out into the world and the only community that looked after them was the Native American community. The Native American community was pretty active in New Orleans. And if you read the reports, Native Americans played a big part in the development of jazz. For example, the rhythms, if you listen to the rhythms in jazz, they're closer to Native American rhythms than they are to African rhythms. For example, um, I read a quote by Jelly Roll Morton that said that in the 1890s, if you wanted to play jazz in New Orleans, you had to pretend to be a Native American. Now, as soon as we start to call it black music, it negates the input of Native Americans in jazz, which has been wiped off the face of jazz history, despite the fact that so many jazz musicians from Charlie Parker, so many jazz musicians pointed to their Native American heritage. This is something that's been discounted. So as soon as we start to call jazz black music, it starts to skew the history, right? Native Americans, Creoles, now I've said this before, but Creoles, um, Creoles saw themselves as not being black. That's the bottom line, right? And if you have a phenomenological view of the world and believe that, that you know, that race is phenomenological, and I think it is, it's like, because what we've got to remember is by the time we get to the 1880s, 1890s, where jazz is starting to really be formed, most black people in America were mixed to some point. I'm mixed raced, right? Most of us are mixed race. It's a, it's a, it's a spectrum. Race is a spectrum. Right, and the idea of calling it black music, we would have to have a logic then that the, the only people that can really play this or claim ownership are the people that can trace all their heritage back to Africa, to, you know. And so the most black people we can find are the ones that have the right to play. This is, this is just racist and preposterous and nasty, right? So um, all sorts of people played um, their role in creating jazz. And I hate to say this, white people did play a role in creating jazz. And if you watch the Ken Burns documentary, any white person that did, and they mainly start with, like, say, Paul Whiteman, they've got to say, oh, they were taking the ideas from black musicians. I just don't believe this is the case. I have read interviews with Louis Armstrong where he said um, the original Dixieland jazz group, um, which goes back to Papa, Papa Jack Lane's group in the 1890s, pre-Buddy Bolden, we've got Papa Jack Lane, well, not people, he's at the same time, sorry, but... Um, Papa Jack Lane running an integrated band, white or black. The, the whole brilliance of jazz is that this is crossing over, right? Now, um, people are going to say, yeah, but if you go, you go back to originally to it, you go back to black musicians, don't you? Sort of, but we're going to get to that in a minute. But the integrated bands are there and there's white musicians there. And Louis Armstrong in 1936 said that the in original Dixie Jam jazz band were like a jazz orchestra they were heavyweights in new orleans right they were people who had just grabbed from jazz right appropriated it which is what the story is told they were players on a scene that included all sorts of different races now we can go back and say that's not true and i don't want it to be true but it seems it is the case and if it is the case it's worth championing because it means that jazz in an era of jim crow in an era of terrible racism was a music form that was able to cut through this crap and it was, it was a music form that enabled black musicians to express themselves. And yes, they did take it over. And yes, they did find their genius within this music form. And the greatest geniuses, if you want to stop, you know, just 
pointing fingers at people and labeling them by the race. Oh, black musicians, we all know this, right? But we're denying something powerful by calling it black music. Um, my fourth point, many of the things we call black in jazz come from minstrelsy, right? So um, in the 1830s, pre-Civil uh, War, there was a comedian who decided it would be funny to create a, a, a comedy routine around about this sort of black character, sort of trampy black character that had all these horrible racist attributes and traits. It was a racist uh, view, comedy you know, it's a little bit like here in England, we will joke about the mother-in-law, you know, and then Les Dawson dresses as a mother-in-law. And in America at that time, they thought this was funny. This was a, a racist view of what black people were. Um, the character he called Jim Crow, and it created um, a highly successful um, uh, form, entertainment form called minstrelsy, which was... A, a right, a white bastardization of a white view of what um, black American culture was. Negative, nasty. But it was very successful. Took over the whole of America. There's groups traveling all over the place. Um, of course, black musicians, especially after the, the Civil War, they're trying to find work, they start to work in this form and they start to influence this and work within it. Now, one of the things I find very interesting is the first millionaire black American superstars are comedians and singers that wore blackface in minstrel sync groups. And these characters have been wiped off the face of history with all the idea of black history. You know, we're going to set the record straight, but nobody wants to talk about these people who worked in blackface, these black artists that were hugely successful. And my household names up until the 1950s, until the civil rights movement started up, when everyone decided to wipe it off. Now, I'm not going to get into this totally. I have been talking to a professor who has really studied blackface, so I'm going to do a whole video on blackface. Because he has argued that the whole of 20th century popular music is blackface. It's his minstrelsy. Rock and roll is minstrelsy. The reason why Mick Jacker, you know, st <coughs> struts up and down the, the stage as he does, pouting his lips and all that, it's basically blackface. It's a white version of, um, of, of, of what minstrelsy was. It's not a white version of what black people actually do, right? And um, so the when we look... But jazz comes out of minstrelsy. It's a troublesome start. Rock music, rock and roll. You know, when Winter Marsalis says um, that, you know, modern hip hop is the minstrel show, he's right, but it's so much more is as well. Think about it. This is troublesome. And nobody wants to get into this. Nobody wants to talk about this at all. All right? Minstrel C, in, in terms, is, is the founding fundamental aspect of American entertainment. It's all rooted somewhere in that. The comedy routines, uh, music, the, the vaudeville, the whole lot of it. And it's a troublesome thing because nobody wants to talk about it. Okay. Um, shall we move on? And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, number five, America's success is based upon receptive i have put a big word here, reciprocity beyond racial and cultural divides. What's reciprocity? That, that's where you work with someone. Now, throughout the history um, of mankind or person kind, I've got to be politically correct here, aren't I? Uh, throughout that history, um, and I use the word kind there, you know, the left want to be kind. That's the whole thing. The, the, the left wants to be kind to people. Kindness is the thing that we're trying to, we're really talking about here. Now, kindness comes from the word kin, which is your family. So throughout, throughout history, we help people that were from our family, our tribe. America is built upon a constitution which bypasses that. And it allows people from different cultures to come together and talk across those cultural divides. There is reciprocity uh, beyond what had ever happened before. Now, what that did to America was in a few hundred years turned it to the most powerful nation on earth. 
Think about it. The integration of these different cultures allowed for so many new ideas to come out, so much reciprocity to come out that America becomes the most powerful nation in on the planet. Right, that is what jazz artistically represents, is that reciprocity, holding hands across different cultural divides, across racial divides. And part of that is the fact that people who arrived at Ellis Island as immigrants had to swear allegiance to the flag of America. They had to take on that constitution. And this wasn't some ideological, dogmatic constitution that told them what to do. It told them that they had freedom of speech, that they were equal to every other person in that country. Right, we knock America and its values now, and it's wrong to do that. Jazz represents those values. So where is where where's the utility of calling this music black? Right. Um, now the next one I've got I've actually covered. The song form is based upon Irish Celtic music form from the white slave plantations. You know, there's people out there that are going to deny that that, that there were white slaves. Right, slavery is not a black thing. Slavery is a thing. And those on the left who want to rail against slavery don't seem to want to rail against the current slavery, which is bigger and more horrific um, right now. You know, child sex traffic slavery is as bad and as ugly as the um, American slave trade, you know, the British American slave triangle trade that happened um, you know, back in history uh, was abolished by, you know, the Western liberal democracies that realised how bad it was. But it's still going on in other countries. And so, um, that this, that the, the, the slavery part is not being discussed correctly, right? Because even within the slavery, awful though it is, there is an integration. This integration in America is painful and ugly, um, but it has arrived at something that is no, not as ugly, if that makes sense. Um, now, from a pragmatic point of view, this is my, um, um, the next one, is um, if we look what I'm discussing here, the argument that's going on that people are arguing against me, and I do understand it, is I am arguing from colour blindness. So I have a definition of racism that goes like this, right? If you make an assumption about a racial group and then apply it to an individual, that is racist, right? It's the effect on the individual that's important. Um, you don't want to apply um, ideas to racial groups. It's not a good idea to do it because the racial group is made up of individuals. So you don't want to do that idea, but it's about the individual, because I'm a liberal, right? I'm a centrist liberal, pretty much. I'm not a liberal in the American sense of a liberal. I'm not on the left, really. Um, so I think it's wrong to make assumptions, positive or negative. So when people, you know, think, oh, you know, black people have natural rhythm, don't they? That's a racist statement to me. It's a positive statement, you know, in a way. And then to go up and say, why don't we get so-and-so in because they're black? Why don't we get them into our band? They don't play an instrument, but they got natural rhythm. That's racism. And I just I, it makes me bristle to think of it. But there's another definition of racism. And what it is, is that there is an elite, a white supremacy that control a meta-narrative to keep themselves in power. And that creates a hierarchy of privilege with black people at the bottom. So black people that live in a country which is run by a white supremacy. And the only way to counter that is to use postmodernist methods of meaning, which are derived from the idea that everything is culturally constructed and deconstruct the, the way people talk because that affects the way people think and control that in a totalitarian way, which is worth doing because it will create a utopia where racism is, um, you know, banished forever. Those people tend to be allied to the left. It's, it's sort of racial Marxism. Now, I'm not a big fan of Marxism at all, right? And I don't think anyone really should be in the same way as they shouldn't be a fan of Nazism, right? But that, that idea, the idea of identity trumping everything else, I don't agree with. 
right? But there are two definitions and they're at war. There is the colour blindness, like the Morgan Freemans and the Martin Luther Kings, and then there's the identitarians here. And they're arguing, that's an argument. And that argument's going on within the black community, right? No one's being anti-black by siding with the idea of colour blindness. Now, my friend Sean Corby has fought this in the courts, Right, he has, you know, fought the idea and won that the fact that um, someone should believe in colour blindness. Now, if you believe in colour blindness as an antidote to racism, then you're not going to call jazz black music, are you? Right. Um, if we look at, at over the last 10 years as the ideas that come from intersectionality, um, critical theory, critical race theory, um, identity politics, all those ideas that have now moved into the mainstream more and more, we have to ask ourselves if that has pragmatically made the situation better or worse. And I would argue it has made itself worse. And the George Floyd, the George Floyd um, period in 2020 that got actually imported into my country here, even though our history is completely different to the history, the racial history of America, right? That has swamped and made this, these ideas almost, I mean, my kids were having a BLM week. Now, a BLM as an organization, we're doing incredible stuff on the ground to help black people. But the people who put it together, the Marxists that put it together, they ran well off with all the money did to the bank. Didn't they bought themselves mansions and gave their families like loads of brilliant jobs and didn't they spend the money, same as Ibrahim Kendi with his um, that research group over at that university. He spent all the money as well. Funny, isn't the Marxists always do that? <laughs> I don't. That's my opinion. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. I am on the side of colour blindness and my friend Sean Corby has been in the court of survival and that, my opinion, is now protected. In, here in the UK, that's a, protected. You, you can have that opinion. Now, those on the left, the uh, critical race theories, believe that when a white person quotes Martin Luther King and says um, that uh, you shouldn't judge someone by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character, that that white person is being racist because they're negating the um, uh, issues that we have no understanding of because we're white. Right, um, that's at least, I, I could keep going on this, so this could go on and on. And there is a big argument going on at the moment. It's all over the, the um, uh, you know, social media platforms. Now, why am I like this? You might wonder why I like this. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because my mum's Indian. My mum came from India in 1946. Back in 1946 in post-war Britain, it was a pretty racist place. It was a pretty racist place for my mum. My mum got called names every time she came out of school and she ran home having names called and she ran names, had names called um, uh, when she went walking to school. Um, that a lot of these were around the idea that she was Native American. That's how dumb people are. Um, the school she went to um, she had her application for university ripped up in front of her eyes by a, the, the headmistress of her school and she was told, your sort don't go to university, even though my mum had got better exam results than anybody else. My mum experienced racism. Now, the reason why she experienced racism when she was younger was because of her name and because she had um, dark skin and jet black hair. In a, in a time when very few people look like that here in the UK. My mum now has got pale skin because she's 84 years old and she has grey hair. And she doesn't get any racism. The people in my family, some of them get racism. I, if, it all depends on just what they look like. There's a mix and there seems to be a divide, you know. I'm never going to get any racism because I'm white. And as some awful person said to me, and I'll tell you who it was, it was Cleveland Watkiss, the legendary jazz singer. I had a rook with him online. And he found me, he looked at me, and he said, well, um, you know, you, your mom might be in India, India, but you present as white. I find that disgusting. Um, uh, we had a right argument, and I... I <laughs> He thinks I'm, you could tell, he thought I was, he, he called me a crank. All his countering against me was about my personality, whereas I tried to keep it general about, you know, jazz and stuff like that. That's always the case. The left will always try and denounce you as a right-wing racist. 
that's always the, their approach here. Um, but anyway, um, people in my family do have, you know, nowadays still get racism, but it's not from white people. Right. Um, behind this push, I believe, um, behind this push to name jazz black music, to have Black History Months, to push intersectionality and on honest and all that, there are intentions behind that, theories behind that. It's, it's, it, it's, it's utopian Marxism. It's like we can build a better place if only we can get everybody to do this. And those who don't count out to that moral compunction need to be dealt with in a certain way. And the way to deal with them is not to argue with them, but to shut them up in some way. That is the what we've got. And I think that I believe that is against the ideas of Western liberal democracy. I want to live in a Western liberal democracy. I don't know about you, but I do. That's where I want to live. Right. Um, those people who complain about, you know, colonialism and imperialism and how terrible, you know, Western liberal democracy is. They, they could go and move to someone like, like you know, China or Venezuela or, or North Korea. They could go and move there. But of course, they will argue that those that is um, leftism implemented by people who don't know what leftism is. Right. Uh, and all they are is for democratic redistribution and uh, based upon race and gender and all that type of stuff. Uh, redistribution has always existed in um, in Western liberal democracies, and I think it's a very important thing. And I think we need to be able to have an argument where those whose interests represent, you know, the powers that be, and those whose interests represent the people on the street. And I'm I'm with the people on the street. I'm not a rich person, and I don't feel anybody is um, arguing my case anymore. And I think that these race hustlers that are arguing from the top are sat in privileged positions that I'm not in, but they are. And they are maintaining their position by putting the emphasis on race or gender or sex. Because what they're not doing is putting their, their emphasis on the underprivileged. Think about that. So now I have got to my last point. There was 10 points there. I didn't list them all. I might put them on the bottom of the screen as we go through. Number 10. Jazz is America's gift to the world. And it fights fascism. Right. And the reason is because jazz is a beautiful music that opens its arms to the whole world and lets everybody in by its very nature. And I find it very moving that a musician like Louis Armstrong was did so much for a piece of music, you know, for a genre of music that was able to put his arms out to the whole world. And now there's people in China, Japan, Africa, Hungary, Russia. There's people playing jazz all over the world. It speaks to everybody. And if we start calling it black music, it can't help but diminish that conversation and diminish its ability to put the arms out and pull people in, right? And there shouldn't be a hierarchy within that, right? People who call it black music is about ownership. It's about separatism and it's anti-jazz. Jazz is the music of integration. And those of you who want to put all the laugh emojis on my Facebook posts when I say that over and over again, but I'm going to keep saying it. If you're a jazz musician and you've been trained in the skills of jazz, you can walk into any country and you can walk onto the bandstand and you can start playing the blues and you can express yourself as a level as high as anything that has ever existed in the history of human art. You can express the very soul of who you are and you can express yourself with a sophistication which is only limited to your own vision. And within that, unlike many other art forms, you can express your individuality, but you can express how your individuality can fit seamlessly into the rest of the group. Remember that rest, reciprocity, rest, <laughs> reciprocity that I mentioned that made America so important? It's embodied in jazz. It's that, that thing that's in America that enables, per some, you know, the, 
the the it the races to hold hands in a circle you know that hippified idea of it's all together is embodied in jazz it, it's not just virtue signaling and saying how wonderful that but be it shows you how it can be done specifically when you listen to jazz and you listen to um miles davis and john coltrane who are stylistically completely different but are able to inhabit the same world and express themselves fully that is the power of jazz and it's my belief that that is diminished by saying black jazz right the jazz police are calling me up you're right danny okay Thanks, see you on the next video.